Father, thank you for your word and thank you for your spirit. I pray that he would take uh, what is yours, apply it to our minds and to our hearts. We thank you and pray you do this, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's see, 2 Kings, still. Uh, we're in division. You've been watching the, the division. If you have lost your uh, timeline map thing, make sure you pick one up. You'll be lost because they, they go in and out, Israel to Judah, uh, all the time. So just watch that uh, timeline that Laurie put together, and you can see where the different kings are and what the prophets who are speaking to them, where that all lines up. So Second Kings division. Uh, one of the, when I was in seminary a few years ago, like a lot, a lot of years ago, one of the profs said, this was just one of these offhand comments, but I thought, it was so profound that I wrote it down. And it was this, the greatest need for the church today is to live as the church, not as the world. That's really a profound statement, if you'll think about it for a minute. And that led me to um, uh, a book that Chuck Swindoll wrote called Improving Your Serve. You may have read this book. It's a good book. He quotes Wilbur Reese, kind of a um, little bit of tongue-in-cheek what um, the church is like today, kind of. Wilbur Reese says this, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a person of a different color or nationality or pick beats with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. No, no, not the flesh and blood one. He'll keep me from my appointment with the hairdresser or at the golf course and make me late for the cocktail party. He'll soil my linen and break my strand of matched pearls. I can't put up with pundits from Persia or sweaty shepherds trampling over my nylon carpet with their muddy feet. My name isn't Mary, you know. I want no living, breathing Christ, but one I can keep in its crib with a rubber band. That plastic one will do just fine. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Sometimes that can describe us, and sometimes it can describe the, regrettably, the American evangelical church. We're going to get some lessons from Elisha in here about how we need to be living. And so we're going to take a look at, um, there's a whole string of miraculous things that Elisha does, and we're going to look at those tonight. In 2 Kings 3 through 8, the focus is on the prophet Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha. And though Israel doesn't yet realize it, her end is near. Deuteronomy 28 and 29 spelled out what an end would look like, and we're approaching that end. So, God has sent Elijah and Elisha to warn them, don't go off the cliff. But unfortunately, they're already headed in that direction. Through his own obedience and God's miracles, Elisha exhorts 
and encourages Israel to turn to him, to trust him, and to follow him. Elisha was to show and tell the people of the vast difference that exists between God and his people and the merely religious. We have this whole section of miracles right here in 2 Kings. Remember, First and Second Kings is Kings. So kind of right here in the middle of Kings, we have this whole section on miracles. Why? Because Israel is driving in the wrong direction. And God sends Elisha to say, stop, stop. You're going the wrong direction. And if you keep going this way, it's going to be disaster for you. And so here comes Elisha with these quick series of miracles to help us understand what God wants his people to understand about him, about how they're supposed to be, and the distinctiveness that that should bring from their surrounding mm, nations, religious people, etc. And so tonight, um, in, the, in the vein of Warren Wearsby, be distinct. Be distinct. That's tonight's lesson. Be distinct. Let's talk about miracles and messages for just a minute. Uh, you'll remember the last time we saw, um, if you will, an outbreak of miracles was in Exodus. And we had the ten plagues. And remember, each one of the plagues was... Um, the Lord showing how he's superior to one of the so-called gods of Egypt. Okay, we have another outbreak here of the miraculous. And so God is trying to tell us something. It's not just, wow, gee whiz, look at that. The miracles were meant to be signs to get God's people's attention. And so they come at us rapid fire to teach us something that we should be learning, something about who God is, something about his care for his people, something about um, his worship. So, miracles and messages. They're to show Yahweh, the God of Israel, as superior to any other pretend God, like Baal, Chemosh, all these other ones that the kings of Israel particularly have, have fallen in love with. So it's to show how superior Yahweh is. It's to show the superiority of being on Yahweh's side. Remember in Elijah, the water, he pours the water all over the thing, and they had already agreed, whoever's God lights the thing on fire, he's God. And so God lights uh, Elijah's sacrifice on fire after the other ones failed showing the superiority of being on Yahweh's side, turning to him, trusting him, and following him, Yahweh, in covenant relationship. And to show the true impotence of following the prevailing religiosity of the culture. Be careful, that might hit home today. Let's start with... This one, chapter 2, I know I said 3 through 8. We're just going to back up a little bit just for a second. Chapter 2 of 2 Kings, starting in 19. One day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. And they said, the town is located in pleasant surroundings, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. So Elisha said, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with water and threw the salt into it. And he said, this is what the Lord says, I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. And the water has remained pure ever since, just as Elisha said. What's the point? The point is God's word permanently transforms lives polluted from cultural religion into fruitful, life-giving lives. Elisha is communicating a sign, a truth, a principle. He's not just throwing salt into a well and saying, ah, now your water's good. 
this miracle has a meaning behind it, and that's what this one is. The next one I love, he leaves, Elisha leaves Jericho, and he goes up to Bethel. As he's walking along the road, a group of boys from the town began mocking and making fun of him. Go away, Baldy, they chanted. Go away, Baldy. Elisha turns around and looks at them, and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of them. <laughs> what? <laughs> Elisha, what are you doing? Uh, from there, he goes on to Mount Carmel, and he finally goes to Samaria. What's happening here? Well, boys is probably a little bit of an unfortunate translation. It probably means young men. This is not like, don't imagine 12-year-old boys. This is young men. 42 are in this gang. It suggests that there were a lot of people who are allied against Elisha, perhaps some kind of even a rebellion of which these young men are part. And so he comes out and he's, he's not just cursing these 42, he's, he's making a statement to the whole nation. And so he judges the disrespectful. What's the point? God won't be mocked. He will judge those who disrespect him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. These young men and those allied with them have no fear of the Lord. And God will not be mocked. He will judge. Um, let's see. What's the next one? Oh, yeah, chapter 3. Oh, okay, so Ahab's son, Joram, began to rule over Israel in the 18th year of King Jehoshaphat's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 12 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, but not to the same extent as his father and mother. Nevertheless, he continued in the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had committed and led the people of Israel to commit. So after Ahab dies, the king of Moab rebelled. Now, this is where you need your maps. So that's where you got your map on one side and your timeline on the other side of your binder. So the king of Moab now rebels against the king of Israel. He'd been a vassal. He'd been a, um, you know, they'd been um, their own nation, but kind of, um, you know, ruled over by Israel by force. And so, King Joram musters the army of Israel. On the way, he invites Jehoshaphat to come with him. And Jehoshaphat says, yes. Uh, Jehoshaphat finally asks um, if there's a, because there's no water, if there's a prophet of the Lord. And one of King Joram's officers says, well, Elisha's here. And Jehoshaphat says, okay, let's hear from Elisha. Well, Joram is, he says, you know, really, he doesn't care for what Elisha has to tell him ever. And so Elisha, uh, he, he says in the uh, second half of verse 13, but King Joram of Israel said, no, for it was the Lord who called us three kings here, only to be defeated by the king of Moab. Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I wouldn't even bother with you except for my respect for King Jehoshaphat of Judah. And he calls for a harp, and the Lord says, this is what the Lord says, the dry valley will be filled with pools of water. The next day about the time when the morning sacrifice was offered, water suddenly appeared. Uh, when the Moabites arrived at the Israelite camp, it looks like blood in the morning sun. So when the Moabites arrived at the Israelite camp, the army of Israel rushed out and attacked them until they turned and ran. And so uh, Israel chased them into the land of Moab, destroying everything as they went. Uh, so God delivers the two kings out of the hand of the king of Moab. And just in case you're wondering, where is Moab? It's right here. 
down here in this brownish color, the bottom of the Dead Sea. And so when you go to Israel and you stay down here somewhere, you'll just look across the Dead Sea and you'll be looking at Moab, the former country of Moab. Uh, so anyway, uh, he, um, he's defeated, but he, in fact, has the Mesha Stella written to commemorate his victory. And so this, this is in your notes. Uh, the engraved stone contains a royal inscription. This, they've actually found this. This is not made up. They've actually found this. Uh, inscription by Mesha, king of Moab, during the ninth century. It celebrates Mesha's victory over the son or descendant of Omri, and they think it probably refers to Joram because he would be the, uh, the king of Israel at that particular time. And so they've found this um, stone with these uh, words on it, and they've, been, they've interpreted what all those things meant. And so there's an extra-biblical uh, point, uh, archaeological discovery that confirms there was a king uh, of Moab and there was a king of Israel who had these names at about this time. So that's a good thing. So delivering Israel from the Moabites, God sovereignly and graciously delivers his people from desperate circumstances, which they are in right now. They just don't realize how desperate their circumstances are. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we purified the water. We've judged the disrespectful. We've gotten Israel delivered from the Moabites. Uh, let's see. Next miracle. One day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead. And you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come, threatening to take my two sons as slaves. And Elisha says, what can I do to help you? Um, do you, have, uh, do you have, what, tell me what you have in the house. Nothing at all except a flask of oil, she replied. And he says, go get as many empty jars as you can. Then go into your house, shut the door, and pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. So she did that, she finally runs out of jars, the oil stops flowing, and she tells the man of God what happened, and he says, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left over. Now she is one of the mm, few who are faithful to the Lord in Israel at this time. So what's God's message through this miracle? in providing for the prophet's widow, that God meets the needs of his faithful, dependent follower. He's going to meet the needs of those who look to him, follow him, trust him, walk with him. Another miracle. One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come by her home for a meal. Um, and she actually makes little room for him to stay in. Uh, one day, he's, uh, you know, I don't know, he's taking a nap or something, and he gets up and he tells the woman that he would like to speak with her. And he asks her, verse 13, what can we do for you? You know, can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, my family takes good care of me, so she feels like she's got everything she needs, from that standpoint, um, Elisha then asks Gehazi, what can we do for her? And Gehazi says, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. And Elisha says, okay, call her back. So she comes back, and he says to her, next year at this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. And she says, whoa, 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 don't tease me like this. And he said... You know, we'll see you in a year. So the child is born, 
He's out helping his father in the field, and he cries out, my head, my head hurts. Um, The father asks a servant to carry the uh, child home, and about noontime, he died. She carries him up, lays him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. Now she's going to go find Elisha. So she goes and finds Elisha, and she's not really telling Gehazi, and she's like, yeah, everything's great. Where's Elisha? And she finally finds Elisha, and he says, take my staff, verse 29, take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. Um, And then Elisha goes back with her. So Gehazi does what he's told and says the child is still dead. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. Uh, He goes in, he lays down on the child's body, and he places his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm. Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, then stretched himself out again on the child. This time the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi, called the child's mother, and when she comes in, he says, take your son. Uh, She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. Um, Amazing what God is doing through Elisha. If you remember your New Testament, Paul does the same thing. Remember when the young man falls out of the window because Paul had been lecturing all night, and the guy falls out of the window and dies, and Paul goes, hey, wait. (laughs) Paul does the same thing, and God brings the that fellow back to life also. So how does, how does God bless the wealthy Shunammite? He does his best for those who trust him. This is the point of the miracle. He does his best for those who trust him, and he hears the prayers of those who trust him, which was Elisha for sure. So God is te- he continues to try to teach his people what does it mean to be mine and to be on my side. Uh, let's see, we get to the end of chapter 4. Elisha goes back to Gilgal. There's a famine. Um, he's back kind of to the school of prophets. Uh, he says, put a large pot on the fire, make some stew. One of the younger men went out in the field to gather herbs and came back with a pocket full of wild gourds. He shredded them and put them into the pot without realizing they were poisonous. Some of the stew was served to the men, but after they had eaten a bite or two, they cried out, Man of God, there's poison in the stew. So they wouldn't eat it. And Elisha said, Bring me some flour. And he throws that into the pot, and he says, Now it's all right. Go ahead and eat. (laughs) Mmm, you first. Here's the spoon. (laughs) And then it did not harm them. Okay. Okay. Transforming the deadly stew. Again, God's word, because Elisha says this is what's going to happen. So God's word is the antidote and healing agent for the deadly effects of spirituality and religiosity. The poison that's pervading the land. The word of God is the antidote to this. Okay, let's see. Now we get another one. Oh, yeah. One day, a man from Baal Shalisha, that one will also be on the final, brought the man of God a sack of fresh grain and 20 loaves of barley bread made from the first grain of the harvest. Elisha said, give it to the people so they can eat. What? His servant exclaimed, feed a hundred people with only this? Is this sounding familiar at all? (laughs) But Elisha repeated, Give it to the people so they can eat, for this is what the Lord says. Everyone will eat, and there will even be some left over. And when they gave it to the people, there was plenty for all and some left over, just as the Lord had promised. What's the point? God multiplies the limited resources the faithful dedicate to him in order to nourish multitudes. Um, Why did... You know, Elisha and Jesus are doing the same miracle. You know, why 
Perhaps Jesus did it for the same reason. Hey, Israel, you're headed in the wrong direction. I will feed you, but you've got to turn to me. I'm the provider. I will give you what you need. So it's very possible that Jesus, the greater Elisha, is picking up on the same thing from back here in his day. He's going to multiply these resources that the faithful dedicate to him in order to nourish multitudes. Chapter 5, a big piece of chapter 5 is the healing of Naaman. You may have... um, Remembered this one from Sunday school, if you had a chance to read this. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Oh, bummer. (laughs) You're a great general, but you got leprosy. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel... And among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. Okay, don't don't miss this. Don't skip over this. Uh, This guy is also a kidnapper. (laughs) And kid like child napper. This is a bad dude. He's a great general. He's got leprosy, but he's stealing (laughs) children to take them back to his people as, you know, however you want to call it, but at least household um, servants or slaves. So Naaman is a brutal kidnapping general who's a Gentile. This guy is bad news. What happens? The girl says, hey, you know what? Uh, there's a prophet in Israel who can heal you of your leprosy. And he goes, huh, okay. So Naaman tells the king. The king says, go and visit the prophet. He sends some stuff with him, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold. This is a lot. 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. When the king gets this, he tears his clothes in dismay and said, this man sends me a leper to heal. (laughs) Am I God? Oh, that's important. Am I God? So at least he knows that God does heal. This man sends me a leper to heal. Am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. Which, of course, was shame on the king, because the king should have known there was a true prophet in Israel. So Naaman goes uh, with his horses and chariots. He waits at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. Now, remember this um, child-napping general with leprosy who happens to be a Gentile. What What does he do? He becomes angry and stalks away. I at least thought he'd come out and meet me and talk with me. And aren't the rivers of the Damascus and the Abana and the far, 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 par, far, par. I'm going to put that one on the final too because that one's hard. (laughs) Better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says, Simply go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River, dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child's. 
and he was healed. Amazing. Then Naaman, now who is this guy again? This is a nasty guy. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him, and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. This is a nasty dude who now says, all those other gods that I was worshiping are nothing. The only God there is, the one of Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elisha refused. Then Naaman said, all right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back home with me. From now on, I will never again offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any other god except the Lord. And notice how Lord is spelled. It's not just to the great sir in the sky. He is by all the all caps of Lord, that he's calling him Yahweh. He knows who this God is. This is this nasty dude knows God, the God of Israel, like Israel doesn't know him right now. That's you should be going, oh my gosh, this nasty dude is worshiping Yahweh. And all of Israel is not. They're worshiping Baal and Chemosh. I mean, this was such a you would have been going, oh, this is freaky. Okay, let's see, where am I? God, I get so excited. Uh, however, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing. When my master the king goes into the temple of the god Ramon to, wa- to worship there and leans on my arm, may the Lord pardon me when I bow too. Go in peace, Elisha said. So Naaman started home again. Amazing. This nasty dude is not only healed of his leprosy, but what leprosy represents many, many, many times in the Bible, and that's sin. Never underestimate the power of a humble and simple witness. This is what's the message of this miracle Never underestimate the power of a humble and simple witness. God has the power to restore health, and God transforms those who humble themselves before him and trust him. An an awful Gentile is converted and redeemed when all of Israel is getting farther and farther away from God kind of sounds like something or other else, doesn't it? Kind of little New Testament. All right. You'll think about it. You'll get it. Healing Naaman of the leprosy. Okay. Now what? Let's see. We're down to about verse 20. Yep. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master should not have let this Aramean get away without accepting any of his gifts. As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. So Gehazi set off after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbs down from his chariot and he says, Is everything okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give them. A lie. By all means, take twice as much silver, Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothing, tied up the money in two bags, and sent two of his servants to carry the gifts. But when they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gifts from the servants and sent the men back. Then he went and hid the gifts inside the house. When he went to his master Elisha, uh, when he went to his master Elisha asked him, "Where have you been, Gehazi?" Probably not a good thing to lie to Elisha. 
uh, I haven't been anywhere. <laughs> Lie number two. But Elisha asked them, don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to receive money and clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle and male and female servants? Because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. His skin was white as snow. Another example of talionic justice. Remember, the talons, like of an eagle or a bird of prey, the talons. Remember, we've, we've talked about talionic justice. Um, Naaman, bad, nasty dude, because of his belief, is cleansed of his leprosy. Gehazi, because of his sin, talionic justice, is now cursed with leprosy. One gets cleaned, the other one gets cursed. God brings it around. Judging Gehazi's greed, what is this, uh, you know, this is a miracle, that God's blessings are given in grace, never as a reward. Again, we see this if Naaman would have been able to pay for his healing, then what's, what's the payment for God's favor? And what if I don't pay enough? Okay? And so this is such an important lesson that God wants to remind Israel of through Elisha. My blessings are given in grace, never as a reward. Do the Gentile general deserve anything? No, nothing. What did he get? Everything. Gehazi should have known better, and so greed among God's servants is reprehensible. Evidently, there are some in, I'm not sure if they were in the school of prophets, but there were probably some walking around pretending, and God is communicating through Elisha that this is, you don't do this. God's servants must avoid conduct that might be perceived as self-seeking. Some great lessons in here um, about God and also about his servants in this particular one. All right, so Gehazi and um, his whole family has got leprosy forever. And now we get another miracle. This is a great one. One day, the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. Then we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Well, please come with us. I will. So he goes with them. When they get down there, they start cutting down trees. One of the, as they're cutting one of the trees, the axe head you know, pops off the end of the, the wooden shaft, the stick, uh, and it falls into the river. Now, if you've seen the Jordan, you, you might be able to go, get to the bottom of the Jordan and look around for the axe head, but it's deep enough that you'd have, to, you'd have to dive a little bit. And he says, oh, no, it was a borrowed axe. And Elisha says, where did it fall? And the man of God, the man of God asked. And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Grab it, Elisha said, and the man reached out and grabbed it. God cares about even the small things of life for those who are faithfully following him. There was a fella in a ministry, this is, gosh, this is 30 years ago, and um, he was so excited about his new relationship with the Lord um, and his, I can't recall exactly what his job was, and it doesn't really matter, but he was not a, a person of means, and he had bought his family shoes for um, the new school year, and that meant he didn't, he didn't have enough money to buy himself shoes. 
And one night, he prayed for a new pair of shoes. And I don't know if it was two weeks or a month. I just can't remember. But a new pair of shoes showed up. God cares about even the small things of life for those who are faithfully following him. Small things, even like shoes. Well, what's next? Oh, yeah, this is some good stuff. When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he'd confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, don't go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word of the place instructed, uh, indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on the alert there. The king of Aram, of course, becomes very upset by this. He thinks there's a traitor. One of, one of his people says, no, 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 it's, it's Elisha. Elisha is telling them what we're talking about. And so he says, go find him. And so he, he finds him. Um, they've now surrounded him. And don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for their, because um, one of his servants um, says, there are, Elisha says, for there are more on our side than theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. And so then Elisha asks, O oh Lord, please make them blind. And so the Lord strikes them with blindness. And then Elisha says, um, <laughs> he goes out and he tells these guys, you've come the wrong way. This isn't the right city. Uh, let me take you to the right city. <laughs> so he parades them all into the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elisha, My father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? And Elisha says, Of course not. <laughs> Elisha replied, Do we kill prisoners of war, give them food and drink, and send them home again to their master? So the king made a great feast for them and then sent them home to their master. After that, the Aramean raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. So interesting. How the Lord works. Psalm 23. That's still in the Old Testament, right? Psalm 23. Okay. Psalm 23. You know this psalm. But there's a part right at the end that is so curious, but when you look at it in this light, okay, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? This is Psalm 23, and you know that. Um, verse 5, this is one of those things you're like, I guess David's just looking for a way to end this thing, right? He's only got 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6 to the end. And, and what does David say through the Lord? You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Now, what he's talking about is a banquet table. And he says, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. In the mid, the, the, the battle lines are drawn up. You can see where the front line is. And David is saying, I am so secure and refreshed in the Lord, I could set up my banquet table right here at the front lines, and you would anoint my head with oil because you're going to take care of those guys. And I'm so sure that I can sit right here, and we can have a feast right now, and go ahead and anoint my head with oil. Preparing a banquet table in light, right out in front of the enemies. It's amazing this, this is kind of like Elisha. Elisha's like, oh, open his eyes so he can see, Lord. Oh, wow, look at all that. <laughs> we don't have anything to worry about. No, don't kill him. Feed him. Send him home. Amazing stuff that the Lord is doing here. Oh, let's see. What do I got to say about this one? Um, God alone is his people's defense. And God's sovereign control allows Israel to treat her enemy as a friend. 
Uh, let's see. Okay. Now this one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, uh, sometime later, King Ben-Hadad of Aram mustered his entire army and besieged Samaria. Now, if you are thinking Ben-Hadad sounds familiar, you are correct, because this is the fellow that Ahab released. Remember he released a king in 1 Kings 20? Remember, and because he went away, the prophet, right, he got slugged in the face and he bandaged himself up and he said, you're going to have to die in his place and all that kind of stuff. That's because Ben-Hadad got released. Well, what does Ben-Hadad do now that he's been released? He goes back and attacks Israel later. Okay. So as a result, uh, he besieges Samaria. As a result, there's a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver and a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. Mm Mm-mm. And horrible things are, are happening during this siege. And Elisha is sitting in his house with the elders, and the king sends a message to him. And before Elisha, uh, uh, before, before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, the murderer has sent a man to cut off my head. When he arrives, shut the door and keep him out. We will soon hear his master's footsteps. And then the king shows up and says, all this misery is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? What? The Lord has only been trying to help him For all these years, he ruled for 12 years. All these years, the Lord keeps intervening with all these miracles. Wake up, wake up, look at me, listen to me, follow me. And now he's angry. Elisha replies, listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow in the markets of Samaria, five quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver, and ten quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, That couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. But Elisha replied, You will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. So then the, there's four lepers sitting outside, and they go on a little walkabout, and they find that the whole army is left, and they've left all their stuff. And so they gather the stuff, and they start hiding it. And then they think, What are we doing? We need to go share this. So they go share it. And uh, when they go back to the city, uh, they're like, no, 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 this is a trap. Um, and it turns out it isn't a trap. They, sends out, they send out scouts. When the people of Samaria rushed uh, or find out, they rush out and plunder the Aramean camp. So it was true that five quarts of choice flour were sold that day for one piece of silver and ten quarts of barley grain were sold for one piece of silver, just as the Lord had promised The king appointed his officer to control the traffic at the gate, but he was knocked down and trampled to death as the people rushed out. So everything happened exactly as the man of God had predicted when the king came to his house. Samaria is being saved from a siege. God graciously provides safety and sustenance for his people, even in times of extreme need. And God rewards the patience of the faithful. Just a couple more here. The woman from Shunem returns home. She left because of the famine. She goes to the land of the Philistines. She comes back. Um, Gehazi, our friend Gehazi, so it's probably not in sequential order here. Um, Gehazi is telling the king about all these things that happened in her family. King says, is this true? She tells him the story, and he restores everything to her that she had left during the famine. And so God preserves and providentially provides for those who trust him and follow his word. Uh, The rest of chapter 8 through 9, 13 is just the intrigue and the murders of one king in Israel to another, and they do nasty things to each other, and then it starts happening in Judah, and here comes... Jehu, remember we had um, um, Elijah and Elisha and Hazael and uh, Jehu. And so Jehu is uh, 
he's just hanging out as his, as his uh, army tent, and the prophet runs up and basically anoints him as the king of Israel, but he did it in secret. And the men, after the prophet runs away, the men said, what did he just say? And Jehu told them, he said to me, this is what the Lord says, I have anointed you to be king over Israel. And they quickly spread out their cloaks on the bare steps and blew the ram's horn, shouting, Jehu is king. So that's where we'll leave it for this time. But we've got Elisha, Hazael, and Jehu, God alone knows and controls the future. And judgment is coming to Joram. Judgment is coming to end Joram's reign in Israel at the hands of Jehu. Very quickly, let's talk about just a few applications here on being distinct. The greatest need for the church today is to live as the church and not as the world. There must be a difference between the Christian and the spiritual or the religious. We must walk as thy will people in the midst of an I will generation. How distinct are your words, your walk, and your witness from your spiritual or religious classmates, neighbors, co-workers, including those who are um, in blindness and ignorance, um, they're, I don't know what else you'd call them, they're like a secular humanist. They believe, you know, man is getting better and we can all create our own utopia and all that kind of stuff. It's not exactly a formal, if you will, religion, but they believe it. It's got tenets. It's got um, beliefs. They have to exercise faith. It's, uh, they think they're just as good as we are, and sometimes we don't give them much to compare or contrast. A couple ways that we could be distinct. We can be distinct like Elisha in obedience. Elisha unflinchingly obeyed the Word of God. He stood up on God's side in spite of certain taunting. He publicly trusted God in desperate circumstances. He waited on God in the midst of famine and want. And he obeyed when there was seemingly no reward for it. And he accurately represented God before a Gentile, child-napping, leprous general. Does your obedience or mine, prompted by love, make us this distinct among our world? But we can't be hypocrites. So we also need to be distinct in love and mercy and grace, not just truth. Jesus came with grace and truth. Not just all truth, though everything he said was true, but he also came in grace. We need to come distinct in obedience, but also distinct in love and mercy and grace. Elisha was amongst the wayward and the lost, as well as the faithful, on a regular basis. When the religious and unrepentant came to him, he was merciful and gracious time and time again in the name of the Lord. Joram's reign was about 12 years. For 12 years at least, every time Joram would come, Elisha would receive him, speak with him, ask the Lord to do something good for him, Time and time again, he was merciful and gracious. How about you? How about me? Are we among the wayward and the lost as well as the faithful on a regular basis? Do people recognize something different about you by the way you love them? by the way you interact with those who taunt you, look down on you, or disrespect you because of your faith time and time again. 
They recognize something different about you by the way you forgive those who've spoken badly about you behind your back or who've hurt you. They recognize something different about you because you demonstrate loyalty to the absent. Now, this is an idea from Stephen Covey. Um, he talks about loyalty to the absent, that if a person isn't in the room and you're talking about that person, let's say maybe everything isn't kind, um, the person or person sitting in the room, when they leave and you're having another meeting with some other people, what are these people thinking you're doing in that meeting? <laughs> Probably talking about them. And so you're not showing any loyalty to the absent and treating them as if they were in the room with you all the time and whatever you would say about them, you would say to their face or you have said to their face. Can we demonstrate loyalty to the absent? Kind of the far extreme of that is um, we can move into gossip by talking about people tearing them down when they're not present. Are we distinct in love and mercy and grace? Do people recognize something different about you by the way you serve those in the community without thought of either reward or recognition? How distinct, really, are your words, your walk, and your witness from your spiritual or religious classmates, neighbors, or coworkers? Be distinct. For next week, read 2 Kings 9 through 15. We're going to continue our march through 2 Kings. We've got, um, this will be the last lesson, and we'll take a break for Easter. But we'll, um, we'll do 9 through 15 next week. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you uh, for these miracles of Elisha and how you're trying to Teach your people about yourself and about how good it is to be on your side and how um, not only powerful you are, but kind and gracious, um, how you seek to bless us, not to do us any harm. Uh, thank you. Continue to help us live in love. Uh, continue to help us um, empower us, really. Uh, that the love of Christ would quench our love for sin. Would you do that, please? And we ask you for all these things to transform us in Jesus' name. Amen. See you in a week.